Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Lewis. You're everybody. And I'll take that as a you know, democracy. So the purpose of this session is going to explore Python, specifically teaching 13 to 15 year olds. But the reality is by this pedagogical stage and development, a lot of how we teach a typical 13 to 15 year old is also applicable to teaching 16 to 19 year olds in a further education vocational context. And it's also applicable to teaching adults new to coding. So I think we'll sort of kick in and introduce ourselves. So Jason, would you like to give yourself a brief intro? Uh, yeah, OK, so I'm Jason Trot. Uh, I'm a lecturer in micro credentials with the Open University. Uh, I've been doing that for about two years. Uh, before that, I was mostly a network engineer um, out in industry. Um, Python wise, I've been using it for automation um, and I've been leading on the Python micro credential for the Open University. Yeah, um, and I mean, yeah, that's that's good, Jason. I mean, that's one of the important things and why Python is now popular in the Cisco Netacare community is software like Packet Tracer extensively uses Python. And um, if you're not aware, it's actually hidden in there. And the session we're going to do later this month on, I think, and you can correct me, Lewis, it's the 30th of May. We're actually going to show you how Python links to network automation, the Internet of Things and cyber security, and how it's now an integral part of cloud computing and the way the industry has moved forward. So anyway, hi, I'm Andrew Smith. Um, I've been in Netacad for a very long time. Um, Terry and I, and Terry's in this session as well, I, c I can remember when we first went and did our first NetCAD training for ourselves way, way, way back in 1999. And well, I've been part of the Cisco Academy community for all of that time. Uh, I have the privilege of leading what's called a Cisco ASC, an Academy Support Centre. We support around 300 educational organisations. By 300, I mean more than 300. And we actually work with other ASCs now where our um, remit at the Open University is around widening participation, knowledge exchange, and how we can enable others to teach the essential topics that we need for digital technology professionals and um, computer science professionals for the future. I want people to use Python. I want people to learn coding. I want young people to learn cybersecurity or whatever digital technology in the hope that it will make them better at yeah, what they do. And it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to end up in industry as a network admin. They could end up as um, finance experts using this technology. They could end, end up as microbiologists or doctors or engineers or even work in the armed forces because a lot of what Python coding is about now um, is being deployed and used by professionals in all of those spaces um, all of the time. As you um, can see, what we're going to do, Jason and I are going to have our mug shots on each of the slides. Why? 260 miles apart. Um, that's just going to help us know who should do the slide next. So I think, yeah, what you do also need to know is as a university, at the Open University, we do focus on distance learning. We're actually a blended distance learning university. And since we worked with Jason to launch the Python micro credential, which is like a short course or a small credit bearing course at our university. We're typically reaching around a thousand students a year uh, who are all yeah, learning Python in order to better themselves for careers. So we've got people all over the UK and internationally doing that. And that has enabled us to then support schools and colleges to, um, doing this as well or we've actually got a large number of other organizations now making good use of that and some of you remember this um, awkward thing called the pandemic we actually used the python coding content in partnership with cisco to actually reach out as part of the government uk government's digital skills toolkit 
think early summer 2020 and with the help of the BBC we probably reached around 20,000 individuals at the time using this resource and enabling them one probably because a lot of them were on furlough to find something constructive to do with their time and their minds but also we found it's actually helped bring an uplift in the terms of um, digital technology students that are learning in this domain out there. So it, it's really good. And that has also meant that we're now able to engage with computing at schools, gender focused charities like STEMETs, awarding organisations and many, many others. So, you know, we try and work to give this all away for free so that you too could teach this for free at your school, college, apprenticeship provider, or university as well. It sounds like a sales pitch. It probably is. It's just we don't get any money for doing this. It's more about just bringing this to everybody so that you're able to make good use of the resources. So first and foremost, I'm going to take the lead for the first part of this session. And I'm going to talk about the free Cisco NetAcad um, Python content. Now, historically, NetAcad used to be a very paid for structure where regional and central academies and then ASCs were charging for support. And we sometimes have to keep reminding people that free is available because that model has changed and it's changed because of the availability of the resources, the way the resources are set up. And there are better ways to actually yeah, leverage income from these things. So if you're a Cisco Academy and want to teach Python and you're teaching it to your established students and you want to charge for an evening class, Cisco, the Open University and all our partners um, don't care. So yeah, for, for us, we're working with Enseco, which is the Portuguese equivalent of the British Computing at Schools and Collectic, which is an open source charity in Barcelona, are all Cisco Academies leveraging this resource, but leveraging it differently. So what I would do for my students doesn't mean in Seco are going to do it or Collectic are going to do it. And that's what's really powerful. So when I share with you everything that I know today, I'm not saying to you, this is the way and this is the only way. What I'm saying is, here are some ideas. Why not go and think about how you could make this successful for yourself? Because once you engage with the Python resources from Cisco, um, you'll find that you're actually entering into a large corporate social responsibility program from Cisco globally, and you would be able to act a range of other resources. So if you want to teach Python and cyber or Python and networking or Python and DevOps or Python and another coding resource, everybody's happy. And this is, yeah, this is the positivity because you know your students and you actually know your curriculum as well. So you know what would work best for them in the future. It just obviously was this in Seco Collectic and Open University collaboration as part of an Erasmus Plus project. We're focusing on Python and other programming languages and computational thinking for now. And that means then that you can access this industry content and develop your students um, for the future. And you can also develop yourself I mean, the last few weeks, and, and this is, I'll cut, approach with direct honestly, I am a Python programmer that programs as if I'm a Java programmer. So I think in Java first, and then quickly adapt it to Python. Jason is a Python programmer, yeah, poor, purely and throughout. And it's interesting because now and again I go, well, this is how I do it in Java. And Jason, you will admit, said to me, what is that? Why would you do that? Because Python, you have to think quite differently. And yeah, they are two quite adaptable and unique languages. And I would argue that Python is probably out of the two, the more flexible and yeah, more adaptable and quicker to learn. And I used to teach Java programming in the late 90s and early noughties. And I will happily admit it was hard work not just for me, but for the students as well, because Java is a very case robust language and you've only got to get one character wrong for the compiler to freak out 
and you'd get a lot of error messages and that would then make it really difficult for the students to work out why they were making a mistake whereas python there are rules it is a much more flexible language and is a little bit more forgiving of the programmer's experience or inexperience and because of, because of that okay i think i've just ended up doing a repeated slide but that's fine and what we also have yeah, been doing then is working with Open EDG, who are the owners of the Python content. They're actually a certification partner and have their own certifications through um, Pearson View and Certiport. And what they've done is they've actually built a resource that fits into the Cisco NetAcad or the Cisco Skills for All platforms, as well as other platforms. And it's now available in English, Spanish, Portuguese, amongst other languages, and quite recently Ukrainian as well. And they create this resource, it's 80 hours in total, but it's really well done, where it's actually designed to be in two parts. The so part A, or Python 1, is the procedural programming and part two or commonly python 2 is the object oriented so some of you may have seen classical um, national qualifications in the past that would have had a procedural unit and an object oriented unit or we talked about programming 101 that they have followed an age-old paradigm here and actually created a structure that um, yeah, works really well. And they've also created a structure that's 100% online and is smart device and tablet friendly. So what I'm going to do is now is um, explore the resources. So I'm just going to move to my other um, screen and actually go straight into the um, Python course. So via chat, can you all let me know if you can see this Python course that you should all have access to? So a quick sort of yes in the chat would be greatly appreciated. Excellent, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, since 1999, Terry. Yeah, long time ago. Um, I'm now discovering that our experience in Metacad is older than some of the people that are actually now teaching it. Jason, not quite, but close. Not, qu not quite. <laughs> not, not quite, but we were, you were in short trousers at the time, weren't you? Yes, very short. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was very mean of me, but all it, all it just really says is that I'm old, you're not. Okay, we've been doing it because um, NSECO is the lead organisation, and they've also worked with Cisco to um, get the Python content translated into Portuguese, Portuguese, not Brazilian Portuguese, but Portuguese Portuguese. Um, we've been using this as the primary platform. However, you probably, when you've been enrolled or you've enrolled, you see that there is links for the English and Spanish um, versions of the curriculum as well. So we've put all the resources on the Portuguese site, but we are actually, created links to the English and the um, Spanish as well. So I'm actually going to quickly just dive in now to the English version because we're, as part of the Erasmus project, have to do all of our delivery um, in English. But you'll see that these two sites are actually quite different, aren't they? What a lot of people don't realise about Netacab is it's actually based on a Moodle platform. Um, I wonder how that happened. I wonder how the Open University influenced the move to Moodle a few years ago. But that's mainly because Cisco discovered it's a very flexible free platform that you as a teacher can then edit and adapt. So we've basically taken a um, Python course, albeit the Portuguese version, and have actually tweaked the front end so that we've putting in our resources to support you and enable you. However, as you scroll down, you start finding the Cisco Open EDG Python content. Here on this English version, it's lighter weight, but you can see exactly the same and the nice thing is you can easily edit this resource and you can add your own resources as well once upon a time we were classroom only teachers i moved from a classroom only environment 
them to a distance blended distance learning environment and I've experienced the best of both worlds. However, nowadays, most educators are hybrid educators. We all do some form of face to face. We all do some form of um, remote or hybrid or distance supported learning. And the NetCAF platform is designed to enable that, designed to enable you to provide resources for your students as homework, or self-managed learning, depending on your terminology. But also what Cisco do with their partners is they provide a basic template where they say, don't remove, but feel free to add as much as you like. So now I've turned the editing on, I can add resources. I can add a whole range of Moodle resources. You do not need to be a Moodle expert. And actually most of these you don't um, need to worry about but you can easily add URLs externally to your own VLE or to your own um, campus system. <laughs> you can add additional resources, you can add additional pages, you can add forums, wikis, and so, so much more. In fact, IMS content package, you can actually import SCORM content from other organizations into here as well. And what's scary or scarily nice is you can actually back it once you've created a course, back it up, and then the next time you run an instant or a presentation of the course in the future, you can then import it back in and keep iterating. So Cisco enable you to sort of manage and maintain that hybrid learning experience. And that's worked really well for us at the Open University, where Jason leads the Python course on our future learn platform and we integrate the two experiences quite nicely where we've got the remote um conversational social learning based experience on future learn and then we push into the netica platform which is moderately adaptable as i say they provide the content verbatim they provide it in a vanilla format but then you can add to it anything that you want so in effect what we've done on this project is boilerplated it and added our own wraparound content that is relevant to supporting you and supporting growth. And that, that becomes quite powerful as an educator because what we are aware of is globally, everybody works in a different education system. In the UK, what you do in a school or a college or a university is different. And sometimes you've got to do slightly different things for national standards or national qualifications. Well, it's nothing stopping you adding it to the, the Cisco resources that you're doing with your own students. So the Open Digital content will provide the core experience, core learning experience. But if you've got an outcome that isn't provided by Cisco, well, you're the educator, you're the experienced expert. It doesn't stop you from adding the little bit if you need to in the future as well, and then export it and keep importing it. Cisco won't take ownership of it. It is yours. You're in control of the imported template. They're basically saying, yeah, here we are. Here is the book or the virtual content. Off you go, and please feel free to do your own thing. So. In the course, and I'm actually going to dive straight into module two. In the course is a yeah very conventional Cisco esque um sort of um knowledge based learning experience. Cisco since the late nineties and um, when they started using Shockwave. Some of you may have to Google what Shockwave is, but when they were using Shockwave, um would have like. Like an experience where it was always, yeah, read the theory and do the thing, or see see the knowledge and then maybe have an interactive graphic or experience on the other side. Now with Python, with Edu, with Jupyter notebooks, and with yeah HTML5, we now have a quite an interactive e-learning experience where literally the student can read the student can immediately do. So they're actually learning on the fly. So there is nothing difficult. And yeah, that, that wasn't complicated. I've edited the code, but also the students can learn to um, screw things up 
as well and make mistakes and learn from that sense. Well, so we've got the Python interpreter environment embedded and it's instant gratification and it's instant learning and it's also instant developmental learning experience as well. So you can then get the students to adapt the code within the course or learn the code on the fly and it will actually work very well for them but yeah, in, in pedagogical terms, whereas historically in the past, when we were teaching coding, it was always very much that didactic experience at the front of the classroom. And then we get them working on worksheets where they would often be typing in the code and yeah, transferring errors to errors as they're typing in the code into Notepad or Notepad++. Then they run it for the compiler and then there'll be the hand popping up in the classroom saying, please, Andrew, I don't know what's wrong with this. And then I'll be over their shoulder teaching them how to debug their own code. So now you can scale this up and work this remotely. And this curriculum is designed that a typical class on Netcad could easily handle a thousand participants with no difficulty. Myself and others have tested it to 10,000. It will work, but we know that there is performance degradation at that share scale. Most of you will probably be teaching groups of between 10 to 150, so you'll have no particular challenge with this. Anyway, back to the curriculum. The curriculum is designed to, you know, be sort of follow, read, follow, understand, follow, do. And they've even designed a set of practical activities as well. What is also useful regarding the curriculum is this thing called the Edube Sandbox. I've actually got one running here, and the Edube Sandbox is publicly available without logging in to any platform whatsoever. So to prove this, I'm just going to power up Waterfox and just start the sandbox. I have honest gov, I haven't logged in and you can use this. So getting your students to work on sort of code development is a lot easier now. And again, obviously it's very much a, if Andrew learns to actually um, click in the field and yeah, type hello Jason and run the code, then it works. But also the students can um, share the code. So you can create accounts, you can then share the code, or you can just do the good old fashioned um, copy and paste the code into a separate um, environment. And obviously I'm just using notes on my Mac here, so it's not difficult. So if they code it in idle or another private environment, they can copy and paste it into EdTube. If they code it into EdTube, they can copy it to idle. They can run it locally. They can run it remotely. So the yeah, transition and integration, and this is designed to work comfortably on most devices, most platforms, and it should work on most tablets as well. I mean, it really is down to screen real estate now in what you can accomplish with this. And I and I have actually coded in it using my iPhone. It's not, yeah, it's a little bit tight. You know, I haven't got the really large iPhone out there, but it works and it works well enough that a student can learn, if, yeah, even if they're sitting on the bus on the way to school or college, or they're you know, doing it in, during a lunchtime break as well. So I do commend, forgive me, playing around with um, EdTube and getting to know the um, platform and the format because it is a really good tool. And also, I am very mindful, and I've encountered this a lot in my um, travels as a Cisco ASC. There are some colleges and universities out there where the IT network manager always says no when it comes to the installation of any software, even the Python um, compiler and interpreter. The great thing about EdTube is you get around this legitimately. It's remote, 
it's secure, it is safe, they can run no bad code. The worst thing is they'll crash the EdTube environment, which is near on impossible. But the thing is then the student gets the experience of writing small snippets of code. And Jason and I have been successful also in using it with our MOOC students, with our future learners, where we've actually set assignments that they have to then submit a project and then they've actually submitted their code that they've worked on in the EdTube environment and then proved to us that it's working because they can easily copy and paste or screenshot and then they've actually submitted the code. So we no longer, at the Open University, it used to be a challenge where we would worry about or consider with care the technologies that the student at the other end has. With EdTube, we don't have to worry at all. And Jason, would you say it's caused us any issues with our two or three thousand students we've taught already? No issues at all, really. Yeah, there you go. That was the most exciting endorsement I've ever had. <laughs> but yeah, it works and it works quite well. So with our range of students, with their range of technologies from really basic laptops to basic smartphones to really shiny MacBook Pro with um, ARM architecture chip sets, which is causing a lot of problems in the world of virtualization. This is the most unproblematic platform that um, we've had the privilege of coming on across as well. So we've looked at the course, we've looked at the chapter, we've talked about the learning methodology with the Python encoding environment. And there is one other quite useful thing on this platform, which is the assessment. So what we have is very much a module by module assessment methodology where um, the student, once they have yeah, studied properly and learned everything, they are then tested on it and it's a progressional testing regime. So there is formative assessment and there's summative assessment. For um, good copyright reasons, I am not going to share this test in this recording. All of you can go and do the test yourself. And there is, we're not worried about the score that you get, but in the scoring, then you can start seeing where the student is learning or where the student is needs you know needs to develop or require support and one of the things that we have in this um, environment and i'm actually going to um quickly dive into one that we've actually got running at this precise moment as you can see we do slightly larger numbers at the open university with students we actually have got the grade book um, and it's an active grade book and you can see straight away that students are starting to get scores in the grade book as well. I'm only just showing some students and the introductory um, scores that they're getting, but we're actually able to see their progression and achievement. And what's also useful in this platform is I can export all the grades and use them for my own validation, module results panel system, or if you're actually presenting this to a warding organization or offering students credit and grades for what they're doing as well. So the testing system is such that you can actually use the module tests and the final test to actually push out into your own systems if you want or use your own grading methodology. Cisco and OpenEDG do not set a passing grade. It's up to you what the passing grade will be. There is a little bit of history and mythology around the passing grade for good and bad reasons, but the actual reality is you choose the passing grade. However, we do commend that students are getting at least 70% or higher because that is what will direct them towards the certification preparation and the certification exams as well. So I'm not saying that they get 70% they're guaranteed to pass the certification exam. What I'm saying is 70% puts or greater puts them in good stead of standing a realistic chance that they might be successful. Cisco exams are hard. Oh, 
certification exams are hard. Open EDGs exams are no easier or no worse than the others. And that's the right way that it should be because we are proving competency and proficiency as well. And we're turning these individuals into professionals that we hope are going to be slightly dangerous in the industry. And because of that, you know, you can use all of the summary tests. You can use the final test. You can use it for your own organization. You can use it for your own results or for your own outcomes, or your own measurement. It doesn't matter. If you want to pass all the students at 1%, nobody's going to stop you. We won't respect you for it, but nobody's going to stop you. However, we encourage you to think, well, treat this as though you're going for, yeah, for your own national or center standards and aiming your students to 70% is the realistic thing. So at the Open University, we are very clear. Our degree standards, we have to accept the minimum pass at 40%. However, we encourage our students to get over 70% and my, do they try and get really good grades? And actually, I would say 70% is probably the low bar um, passing grade on these assessments. Obviously, we don't just use these assessments for our degree credit, but we use them as part of our degree credit to actually encourage, yeah, sort of good professional skills, professional understanding and disciplinary knowledge as well. And we've found that it's been very successful in helping our students um, gain successful grades. And part of the reason is a student, she or he, if they do um, these tests, tend to then perform well on any of the academic elements around coding and computational thinking, and also perform very well when we set them the programming project. They're never guaranteed, of course, but we see a much stronger performance. The student that tends to do reasonably well on these formative assessments tends to then do well on the sort of professional outcomes and the final results therein. OK. So we've ex quickly we've explored our coursework, but what I'm going to do also now, and I'm actually going to do this, Jason, because I realise that I've actually got you doing quite a bit of talking a little bit later. If you're happy with that, Jason. Yeah, yeah he's, he's cool with that. So I've explored how a course works, but I'm actually going to quickly create a course on Netacad. And it's, yeah, not it's not difficult. They've actually made the process a lot simpler now. So I'm actually going to, yeah, I'm, I'm logged in. I'm in the I'm teaching and any of you that are Cisco Academy instructors will see I've you know, done something similar before. And if you're not a net account instructor, we'll provide guidance on how you can actually access this content in a little while. But if you just click on create course and I will just now, as you can see, I'm waiting for the spinny, spinny Internet hamster. Um, I work with a lot of Cisco Academy, so forgive me as I quickly scroll through and change to Enseco. And I'm just going to type in PY for Python to actually search. Um, yeah, yeah, you can actually see the full extent of the resources that are available now on the NetAcad platform. But if I type PY, I save myself a bit of bother and I'm going to go into the partner PCAP programming essentials in Python. So Cisco always lists um, partner courses like the coding and like the Linux courses and the cloud security courses as partner courses. And we do a lot of work with Open EGG. They're great friends of Enseco and the Open University. And then we just click on continue. And then you'll see, yeah, you know your language. I'm not going to explain to you which language fit, but I'm going to suggest that you pick um, whatever version is the self paced version. And the reason why we like the new self paced ones is all of the assessments are automatically enabled for you. And also, you can actually get the students to self enroll in the self paced course rather than adding them. But there is nothing stopping you adding a student to the course if you so wish. So it's a win win situation. Course ID is totally up to you, but I always 
um, advise that you call it something sensible that you will remember for a long time. So I've called it Python at Insinco 0523. So I always put the month and the year in my courses. And the course name is what the students see. So it could be Python for Beginners 0523. You know your students, you know your logic. The default period is always three months. The minimum is 28 days. The maximum is 365 days. Cisco will not let you go over that. Um, why? Because this is how they control their relationship with their learning providers, the commercial arm. Also 28 days, that is the same reason. To offer this for free, the cost of free is, there's a, a couple of time constraints. So I'm just gonna set this for argument's sake to the end of September. And this is editable later, and I can keep extending this until the 10th of May 2024. Description, totally up to you, but it's always something helpful that the students will see in their I'm learning page. Because that's where you can put your email address, a link to your VLE, guidance of when you're available, or go away, please do not contact me. This is, yeah, you've got 200 characters to just get some information in front of the student on their I'm learning pages. I know not all students read everything all of the time. However, as a distance learning expert nowadays, I know that the more places you put, the more information that is the more helpful for the students, the more likely they are that some of them will read it. There is no limit on instructors. I can add other colleagues um, at will. And one of the other things for the Cisco NetAcad platform now is as soon as you become an instructor on NetAcad, you're automatically entitled to teach the Python course. Cisco have two categories of courses. They have what they call their non-core content and their certification ready content. For non-core, like Python, Cisco's view is if you're smart enough to teach it, you're smart enough to read it first to make sure you're ready before you deliver it to your students. But our certification ready courses like CCNA, no, you must do training on that. But at the Open University, we offer free periodic training um, every so often. Sorry, that was a parking notification. But you can add as many colleagues in your organization as you wish. Ignore the facilitator. The facilitator is a role that exists at the higher level for the certification ready courses. But if, yeah, as I say, I could. Time and other people. And why would you add other colleagues, even if you're the only person teaching in the classroom? Well, it shares the load, it shares the admin, it shares the support. And also, if you are unavailable away at a conference or off sick or on vacation or leave the organization because you've got a better job, then that, and that enables continuity for the students and every, the others are able to support that. So at the Open University, we always have at least two instructors in a course. And when I used to teach in the further education myself, and actually Terry Salt, who's here, we would always put each other in each other's courses as a support mechanism, because that was the right thing to do, just in case one instructor is not available. That was in the old days when you could only add two people, now, we haven't actually found out what the limit is yet. I have added 20 instructors to one project that I was working on. So for most of you, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's actually quite, yeah, quite valid and quite flexible. And as soon as you add them, and as soon as I then click on publish now, Jason and all my other colleagues are now going to get spammed by, or emailed by NetCAD telling them that they're in this course and in this platform. And you'll see if I quickly click on the launch course, which I'm opening in a new tab, you've got the vanilla basic template 
that um, I've shown you already. But what you've got on this main admin page is some quite interesting things. One, you can edit these details, which means you can change the name of the course or change the end date. But what you can also do is, can you see that URL at the top? That is actually unique and bookmarkable. So you saw me quickly flying into my bookmarks and diving into these courses on the platform. Well, the URLs are all static URLs on the Neticad platform, which means you can create VLA or platform links directly into these as well. And that will make your life a lot, a lot easier for admin. So for myself and my colleagues, the Open University supports around 5,000 students on that card. I can assure you at that scale, we need to have quite a robust methodology for administration. And to administer that, we all then control the bookmarking of the links and naming of the courses so that we can easily go and find them on the NetCAD platform. Obviously, if you're just teaching one group of students a year, probably not so critical, however, still useful. The other thing is there is this wonderful blue add students button and as soon as I click on it you'll see you can either add an individual student one at a time painful but useful if you've got a late entry on your course however you can import a CSV I have tested this and my track record is 19,000 on the CSV it will batch it it will queue it and it will take about two or three hours before they all appear on the system. But they do provide a useful template that you can actually decant to your student database. And all they actually need is first name, last name and email address. And because you can import at such a large scale, um, it is then quite useful for sort of various programs and projects that you work on. I know that most of you have got access to student data, you've got that. What you can also do is import from course. I'm just going to quickly click on that. And I, because I'm involved in a lot of academies, you can actually import between Cisco academies. Not that you should really do that. Um, but obviously you can also import your own students from other courses. So if I wanted to, I could now um, pick up all of you from this program today and immediately import you into this course that I've created now. And I'm quickly going to do that. You're going to see it very briefly, but I'm not going to um, hit the button. And you can see there that I could actually select all the students or I could just select specific students if that's what I wanted to do. So it's actually quite robust. So a lot of you might be teaching Python and taking them onto C++ or taking them onto JavaScript or Linux or something else. It's nice then because once you've got the students into one group, you can then move them from group to group to group on the system without doing um, yeah, individual um, imports or self-enrollment processes as well. So Cisco have designed this over the years to become easier to administer. There's always a little bit of work, but there's less work. What is also very nice, and this is why you create self-paced version, is you can create a self-enroll page where it will email you when the students self-enroll and you can add your own um corporate um logo as well so i'm i'm just going to be egotistical i'm just going to put my mug shot on just because that was literally the first photograph i found but i'm just going to put some helpful guidance learn to type andrew and welcome information here and i'm going to make it public i did it as quickly as that and i still wait for the um Thing to actually, so I should click on the link properly. Why is it not doing it? You know, sometimes when you work with technology, it just doesn't want to play, does it? Make public. This one I wanted it to go public. It's just sitting there, not doing anything. So maybe if I, you yeah, know, my photo is available. I'll make public again. Ah, there you go. Sorry about that. The internet had a brief moment, but that's 
Um, that that's the yeah the way it is, and I'm just going to yeah that should be. I just quickly do that. That should appear. Then maybe that load. No, it's not let me save an update. It's obviously not let me pick that photo up. Chase I it. think it's over the file size limit. Oh yes. Well, 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 well spotted, sir. Um, nobody likes a smarty pants, but well spotted, sir. Yeah, I forgot there is a um, limit, so I'm just going to pick out a very basic open university um logo i'm just obviously i'm relying on dropbox cloud saving and then i will just quickly edit that so hopefully that will um come up as well if it doesn't it doesn't so it's not picking that up either i hate technology anyway the point is if i click on that url now that I've generated, even that it's not allowing me to pick up a logo at the moment. You can put your corporate logo. You can then see it's got a nice enrollment page. And if you were not logged in, the student will actually see um, country information, location information, age information, because Cisco won't let anybody under the age of 13 on their platform for legal reasons. But then you they, you can immediately log in, and the, the individual can log in using whatever email she or he prefers. So you don't even have to dictate organisational email addresses. So we have a lot of students that like to use Gmail email as well, and it's very straightforward. So now we use that self enrolling for a lot of our courses at our university, where it's a Python course or whatever, and it trans yeah it gets the students in quickly and easily and I appreciate a lot of you signed up for this program using a similar self enroll link a while back and that's made this yeah it very easy for us then to pass on information to you and keep you engaged in this program as well so finally um if you want to become a Cisco Academy and you want access to the Python content Obviously, you could quickly QR code this, or there is a bit.ly called Become Netacad. Obviously, it's toggle case, it is case sensitive, or email me on andrew.smith. Genuinely, this is about giving it away for free and enabling others to be successful. If you want to join the Open University ASC community or we're working with other ASCs in the UK, that is fine. But yeah, I think. If you haven't got access to being able to create Python content yet, I would like you to, because we would like our academies to join our ASC community, whether it's us or one of our other ASCs, because the other reality is, once you join an ASC, you're also gonna be able to gain access in the longer term to the certification ready content that's out there as well. So, and the support that we're able to offer. So I'm gonna hand over to Jason, who's going to do a brief demonstration of the EDUB environment. If you haven't um, linked to edube.org sandbox, you can again quickly QR code your way to it. And um, Jason's going to take over the screen sharing from this point onwards as I unshare my screen in about 30 seconds. I'm going to mute my microphone as well, so I need a drink of water. OK, so we'll wait. Oh, uh, I will share that QR code as well. Uh, OK, so Jason, you have full control, right? Yeah, uh, if okay. you can see my screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not that, not at this moment, but oh, yeah, OK, OK. Fine. You can now? Yeah. OK, good. Uh, let me share that QR code. OK, this is the QR code or the link at the top, uh, adube.org slash sandbox. Sandbox is this one. OK, cool. OK, so uh, hopefully you managed to open the sandbox on some kind of device. Like Andrew said, it does work on mobile devices if you want to scan the QR code. Uh, works quite well on tablets, I've found. 
Um, once you're there, it will look like this. Um, the uh, main point I want to uh, get across is that there are multiple languages, and you can choose that from the top right. So this covers C++, um, and C, C, uh, the older version of Python 2.7, the latest, well, not the latest, but a newer a version of Python. Um, it covers JavaScript, and it covers HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as well. Uh, just as an example, I'll click that one. So you can see here, you've got your files across the top. So you've got your index.html, your style.css, and your app.js. Uh, you have a development console at the bottom, and your web page would be displayed at the top if you were uh, to use it for HTML. But yeah, we're focusing purely on Python, so you might consider using it for um, different classes as well. Um, just as a very quick demonstration, um, we could maybe create a application to calculate the area of a square. Um, I like to teach uh, students to comment their code almost immediately because I, I find that documentation is uh, the most important. So the way that we do comments in Python programming is with a hash. Um, so we could say like a program to calculate the area of a square. OK, so that's our comment done. Um, we could then use um, an input. Yes, obvious variable names, definitely. Um, so to use an input and assign it to a variable, we can de declare a variable. So you just use a variable name in Python. So uh, length, we say the length of a square or a rectangle even. Uh, and then we equal that. Um, and if we did input, and then uh, we can have the text that we want to appear in the console. So enter uh, the length of the rectangle. Let's change this to rectangle because obviously we want two measurements. Uh, and then we end the, the string quotation and end the input. By default, um, input is going to take that as a string. So we need to change that. Um, we're going to talk about data types later in the presentation. Uh, so if we make it a float, we can then end that bracket on the end as well. So now this is taking an input and converting it to a float and storing it in the length uh, variable. If we do the same, self document and code, and the yeah, variable names are self explanatory. Uh, if we do width uh, equals, and then we do the same, so float and then input, ooh, uh, and then we go enter the width of the rectangle. I'm hoping you can see the text clearly. Um, you can zoom in and out on uh, on Teams, uh, either with control scroll on a computer or pinch and zoom, or if you're on tablets or touchscreen devices. Um, OK, so now we've got our two uh, variable inputs. We can then do the calculation. So if we say area as the variable name, and we do uh, length, uh, and then multiply that by width. Come on, trackpad on a Mac. There we go. Uh, OK, so that's on the calculation. Uh, the link was, uh, give me a second, at the top here, adoob.org slash sandbox. There we go. Thank you. OK. So now we've done the calculation, we want to print something to the console. So if we use the print function, we can say um, in a string, uh, the area of the rectangle is, 
uh, give it a colon, and then if we use a comma to separate, then we can use the area uh, variable that we uh, done the calculation under. So we run this, we get the string that we entered, and then we can type in um, a integer. So let's do five and press enter uh, and say the width is three. Ooh. Run that again, five, three. You can see it does the calculation uh, and outputs the rec the area of the rectangle to the uh, the console. Um, so yeah, that's a very quick demonstration of how to use um, the Adobe platform. Um, are there any questions immediately? Uh, no, I mean it's quite it's quite a good piece of code you've shown there, Jason. Because in in that um, quick example, um, what you've shown um, everybody is quickly how you've handled two completely different data types. So you've got a string, which is technically an object or a complex array of characters, and you've managed to convert it immediately to a float or a real world number and do a calculation on it. So if you didn't put that float in, that area um, calculation will probably do some weird things, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would give you a lot of errors. <laughs> yeah, so why <laughs> type errors? Yeah, so would you like to remove one of the floats from the input? Just the, yeah, and obviously the other bracket. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So I'm going to clear the console with the refresh button and then run it again. Yeah. And we can go five again, three again, and you can see Bang. can't multiply non integer values. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a good way of showing you. If that's the quickest way of showing a student, all input is a character stream. Um, yeah, the data is coming through. It's not coming through as a number. It's coming through as a character stream. In, and this is true for Java as well as um, Python. So I talked to that, which I know. So it's a character stream that's coming through. And we have to co convert that output, or sorry, input, correct myself, into a form that you can actually do proper computation on. And what that float bracket input bracket does is called casting. And it is basically a very clever way of converting from one type to another. So you can, you can actually ca cast a whole range of types. You can cast, yeah, floats to integers, which is rounding the number. You can cast integers to floats, which means that you're putting a decimal point after number and you can continue the calculation as well and as jason shows there you can then easily copy and paste that code and do yeah do some quite useful things with it i mean how long did that take you to edit and demonstrate to this group of students sorry instructors uh, teachers uh, even five ten minutes if that i think yeah yeah so i mean now now you've got that and as an educator, what would I do? Well, I would, yeah, like Jason's done as well. I bet you've actually got that code already written somewhere else, so you could have copied and pasted it in. I could have, yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah. I find it, I, I can type quick enough that I could explain and type at the same time. So yeah, I'm happy but to if do you're both. not, and you want to copy and paste a line in at a time, that's also yeah. a good didactic technique. Um, and we have a phrase in the UK, and I know some of you are um, yeah, old enough to know this. Yeah, there is a television programme for children where it's, here's one that we did earlier. OK, so it's having that demo code ready and then easier to pull straight into the EduBe environment. And I've seen that our friends from Seco with the Haskell code and other things have done exactly the same as well, Dave. Yeah pre built some stuff and then they start editing it as they go along. OK. So we're going to take um, it's my turn to take over now. So we're actually going to explore our um, loop programming in um, Python. So bear with me a second as I um, take control. So uh, you've unshared now, Jason. Thank you very much. And I will share again.
we met somebody. So I was trying to check. Okay, it's not playing. There you go. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yep, excellent. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got fun with loops. Now, this is actually a me teaching method. I've adapted it slightly. So, as you've learned, I used to teach in further education a very, very long time ago. Um, further education in the UK or vocational education or technical school um, is a very different environment. We've got, we used to have quite a wide range of students. And to be honest, some of them would struggle with programming because they didn't have the educational background or support previously um, when they were at school. So we had to find clever ways, not just teaching them network, teaching them programming, teaching them maths and teaching them many other things. And one day I had one group of students and I thought, well, let's make this a little bit more entertaining. So I ended up teaching them about sort of Benny the nightclub bouncer. So here we've got Benny the ro robot nightclub bouncer. And I was teaching the scenario around programming where you've got to program a robot or an automaton to do repeated tasks um, continually. OK, so here we've got the nightclub bouncer. You've got the customers, the punters. They're all queuing outside the nightclub. And yeah, the, the job of the robot nightclub bouncer is to make sure that the customers behave. OK, so. Um, yeah, if a guest is causing a bit of grief, and you know, we've all, we're all mature individuals, and most of our 13, 15 year old students know what a nightclub bouncer does. So it's about, yeah, intimidating the customers. So it makes it entertaining, it's a little bit of fun, and the young people, you know, will have a laugh about what goes on here. However, they learn to program this nightclub bouncer, and the DJ, who's a clever individual and knows how to mix his decks and stuff like that, but he is still trying to learn his way around programming. So what we talk about first with our students is a scenario that's very simple, which is, well, if a customer is going to cause grief and give a little bit of lip to the nightclub bouncer and cause trouble in the queue, he's allowed to shake him 10 times. OK, so we're going to do um, a little bit of code in edu now where I've got to find my edu tab. Bear with me a second. Just quick to uh, um, reload a new sandbox. So I've got this little bit of code um, for loop equal in range 10 print shake and it's going to then convert the loop number to a string. This JSON converted um, a string to a float because the loop is an integer, a real world whole number to output it to the screen. I have to convert it to a string. So I'll run this code. And he sh the robot has shaken the customer 10 times. What's the first thing that we've learned about this code? You can put it in the chat. What's special about what's just happened with that code? I've said it's 10 times. What's happened there? Do you really like the guess? What will stump a student? What will confuse a computer? Yeah, that's it. It started from zero. It started from zero. And this is an important thing that we have to I encounter time, time, and time again with all range of learners at all ages. If they forget that zero is a number, OK, and computers by default will count from zero because it's a proper number and it's a proper computational state. So you actually have to tell it where to start from in order that you can actually then run the loop for a sufficient number of times. So it would have helped if I cleared that. My apologies. So you actually say the starting point. You see there. It starts from one, it goes to 11, it's 10 steps. So something else you will notice in Python is you think one to 11 is 11 steps. No, it's one to 11, 
it's 10 steps and you can uh, yeah and it's the same whether you do now do 10 to 21 that there is this slight ordinal um difference where it, at 20 it stopped at 20 it didn't stop at 21 so a lot of students will get caught out by that very quickly because they forget that zero is a number and it's about positional moving as it's iterating through the programming. So whilst that was a very simple piece of code and yeah, in sort of the world of coding, um, probably one of the most basic bits of coding that you'll ever teach anybody, the reality is that zero point is the one for first thing that will catch a student out and the, yeah the reality the reality is that yeah we're trying to teach them if we actually run this code um again is that zero is a number zero is a position and if you were to think of this as points on a graph then zero always exists on the graph as you move from negative to positive and what zero has no value if you are an accountant it has value if you are um, plotting a, a missile especially if you are launching it from a submarine because it has to be a negative zero surface level and then a positive as it's flying up into the air and as soon as the students see that they start understanding a little bit more about loops and about how computers actually carry out a little bit of basic computational thinking, where zero will always be a value and zero will always be a number in this code environment. Anyway, so what's happened? Well, it counts from zero, but what would be the problem for a nightclub? Why would having a fixed loop of only 10 steps be um, a little bit of a problem if the robot is shaking the poor customer? So I'm shaking the customer, I'm shaking the customer, and I'm shaking the customer 10 times. What what will be the problem with that? Any guesses? What customers start doing as you're shaking them? They, Jason's smiling. Probably thinking a couple of students he wants to shake at the moment. <laughs> OK, I'll help you out here. The thing is, they start screaming and making a lot of noise because usually only after two or three shakes, the customer's got the idea and they've given up. Yeah, they're screaming, they're creating merry hell and they're getting really upset. They're making a lot of noise and they're upsetting all the other customers as well. And not everything is fixed in the coat. You could give the customer brain damage. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a robot and he probably, well, I'd say we call robots, he could probably really cause a lot. So you want to shake the customer just enough until they're getting slightly annoyed and stop them there. But remember, we're dealing with young people and you need something that is a little bit visceral and humorous to deal with uh, yeah, this coding. So, yeah, shake. So what we actually need to do is shake the customer then check if they are screaming okay so that yeah shake are you screaming shake are you screaming shake ah you're screaming now i think i should stop so what we actually have is a little bit more of a complex process but we have what's called a conditional or a while loop okay so i'm just going to copy and paste that code into my environment and just clear that as well. So, as I say, I'm a big fan of obvious um, variable names. I also like using underscores in my variable names because it's easy for people to read um, because then you can make sort of very sympathetic, yeah, like stop, shake, shake, count, and should it stop, okay? Um, if you don't, if you can't work out what those variables actually mean, then I think there is, uh, yeah, there are other issues at hand here. But if we just run this, is the customer screaming? No. 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 I could actually press X as well, but it, um, it's um, 
very simple code where I've actually just it's just looking for the value lowercase y in the string input. OK, um, I, we haven't got time to do really clever code where it's checking. Yes, capital Y, yes, or all of that or changing values. It's a very simple piece of code, but at least now my robot is the customer screaming. No, no, no. Yes, they're screaming and we now will apologize sorry customer i won't shake you again what we've also used here is something called a boolean or yeah true or false and that way what we've said in the code is i was yeah i will stop the shaking while it's not equal to true okay so yeah whilst it's false i will continue shaking but as soon as i say stop which is true, that's it. We'll break out of the code and exit the coding routine for the um, individual. What we've learned, one of the things I've learned in working with Jason is um, in Python, we only have um, free checking loops or fixed loops. We don't have something called a post check loop. So I know some of you may I've come across repeat until or do while loops where you do the thing, then check it. And there are a lot of programming languages that use that. And um, Java is one of them in the old, old school. Pascal is one of them as well. Here in Python, all you have is the while loop, the pre check loop. So you cannot you've got to code it for a post check in or you've just got to write the code to do the thing first and then change the condition afterwards. Um, the danger of post checking loops, especially if it's edge te testing or boundary testing or critical system testing is it could carry the thing out even though the condition is already dangerous to do so. So it do the thing, then test. But the thing could already be on fire, whereas with a while loop, it's saying you're almost saying, is it on fire first? So a customer could be screaming at the beginning and we could bail out of the routine very, very quickly. But yeah, we've just got some slightly different coding paradigms going on in the world of Python, where if you're a little bit old school and you know about the do while or the repeat until, I wish you luck. They don't exist. I tried to create an example, and that's where I was educated by Jason on stop being a Java programmer. Um, we just simply do not do those things um, in the code. So is there any suggestions about how this code could be improved? OK, that was very funny, Ambrose. Um, we'll send you an ice cream in the post lecture. <laughs> so I just spotted that one. Yeah, that I mean it's exception handling. So I mean we could do a try in a catch situation, but that is a little bit more advanced program at that point. And actually, good Python programming and Jason taught taught me about this is all about exception handling from the outset. In fact, actually, good Java programming is about exception handling. However, um it, yeah some some exception handling around streams data streams and spreading is um implicit within java but within um loops in java there is no implicit exception handling at all so yes we could actually add some precondition and some control so there are no do while there's no repeat until is this a good thing or a bad thing? My opinion is based on what I've been learning over the last few weeks as a bit of an old Java programmer. Actually, it's not a bad thing. I think it's actually encoded quite sensibly because I say if you really need to do a pre check routine, then you'd write the code um, to actually do that by using uh, yeah, the um, Boolean condition statement. So at that point, I'm very mindful that um, it's time for a break. 
So it's 22 minutes past five. I suggest we all go off for a comfort break now and we reconvene at 17.35. OK, so I'm going to pause my screen sharing. Jason Lewis and I will be back just before 17.35. Thank you all very much for being patient with us.
everyone. We've got another couple of minutes to go, but I thought I'd just warm up my microphone. Yeah. For uh, amusement, professional amusement, of course. Could you yeah. just type in the chat where in the world you are? You could give either city or country or region. So obviously I'm in England, but I live in Northumberland. Where, where are the rest of you? Because I think that would be really good to know. Algeria, good to meet you. Any other offers? I mean, ah, London. I was in London yesterday. Algeria, excellent. Probably more, probably Cayman Islands. Uh, yes, I, I thought I recognised your name. Sunny Glasgow. It is always sunny, even when it's dry and it rains. And Manchester. Where are we going to be in Manchester um, in July? Nigeria again. Okay. South Carolina. Okay. Am I supposed to say good morning or is it lunchtime now? I'm always a little bit lost with um time zoning. But it must be lunchtime in South Carolina. Hello, Canada. Yes, I go to Where in um where is New Brunswick in Canada relative to the bits of Canada that people in England would know? So you're in Northamptonshire now, Terry. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. We'll look at Rollins. Okay, I know where Nova Scotia is, so that's the closer part. Okay, good morning in Cayman. Oh, it's tea it's late tea time here in the UK. It's half five in the afternoon at the moment. Well, I apologise, it's getting a bit noisier in the environment that I'm in at the moment. There's quite a few people here, but I'm going to be on mute for quite a while now. So I'm going to hand over to Jason, who is probably fighting the kettle at the moment. Oh, no, the kettle's safe. Kettle is done. <laughs> as as, as yeah. a British person, you learn very quickly how to make your tea at high speed, don't you? Do you, you recognise the mug? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, David, our Scottish colleague, was really jealous that he missed out one of them. <laughs> I had to give him one of those mugs, otherwise he was going to get violent, a bit like the <laughs> robot. Yeah, do you want to show them the other side? And it's, 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 it's it probably not quite. It's not. It's. I mean, it's, there's fine. There's binary on it that you, you have to work out what the binary is. So it's a C O U Cisco mug with binary on it. <laughs> I had those made um, early 2020 for a competition that we were going to do, and then the pandemic came along, and they ended up collecting dust in my office for three years. So I just ended up giving them away to colleagues because the whole idea of the competition had long gone. But that's life. Okay, so I'm going to mute. And it's over to my colleague Jason, where I will occasionally chip in as his psychic or when he asks me. OK, uh, just to answer Paul's question first. Um, it, do you have to be logged in to get to that link? Yes, I'm wondering if you haven't signed in to that course. So Paul, email me on andrew.smith and I'll at open.ac.uk and I can sort it out. OK. So uh, I'm going to run through some of the uh, common topics within uh, the PCAP, uh, PCEP, PCAP uh, certification um, that's offered by Open EDG. Um, so first we're going to have a look at conditions. Um, so 
you can think of this as like the machine almost thinking uh, and comparing stuff. Um, so uh, if we consider like conditions within uh, an if statement, for example, uh, in this top example, we have if and then if the condition is met, it will do something. If the condition is not met, then it will do the else statement. So it would do something else or something different. Uh, so it starts giving you pathways for the code to follow. Um, and it's kind of like the code making decisions, but based on the conditions that you set. So it's not quite thinking for itself, you're setting the conditions. Um, within Python, uh, you can extend uh, an if statement. So we can have the if condition. I'm not sure if you can actually see my mouse or do I need to use the pointer tool? Um, you, you can have the if condition. Uh, if it does that, oh, you can see the mouse, that's fine. Um, so if this condition is true, then it will do something. You can use an else if or elif, uh, check a different condition, and then it will do something different. If it fails this condition statement as well, it will move to the else statement. You can have multiple elif statements. So you could have one if, three elifs, and then an else, for example. Um, I'm actually going to uh, go back to what Andrew said. Uh, he was talking about how he used to program in Java, and switch and case statements used to be a, a well, they still are. Um, yeah, so the latest version uh, has added it. Uh, do you want to briefly explain switch and case, uh, Andrew? If you're there. OK, maybe not. <laughs> maybe we can come back to that. Uh, so what what kind of conditions can we use in those if statements? Uh, so we can have comparison uh, conditions or logical conditions. We'll come to an example in a minute and uh, we'll run it in the Adobe sandbox. Um, so you can have an equals to uh, condition where A is equal to B. You would represent that with a double equal sign. You can have A is not equal to B, which we saw in uh, Andrew's previous uh, example. It's the exclamation mark with the equal sign. Uh, you can have A is less than B, just a less than sign, less than or equal to, less than and an equal sign. Other way around, you can do more than as well. So more than symbol or more than or equal to. Um, I'm going to assume you understand logic. If not, it is explained in the course. Um, so I won't go into detail, but your your main ones are going to be uh, and. So are both statements true? It will output true. Um, your second option is or. So uh, is A or B true or possibly even both? Then it would output true. So these are logical and uh, Boolean kinds of um, conditions. Uh, you can have the opposite of, of that as well by using the not um, condition. So not A or not B, it would uh, reverse the result. OK. Uh, so here's a bit of an example. Um, determine what kind of triangle uh, you have inputted by the three lengths of the, the sides of the triangle. So if they're equal, we can pretty much agree that it's an equilateral triangle. Um, if it's an isosceles triangle, then you're going to have two equal sides. And if you only have, if none of the sides are equal, then you're going to have a scalene triangle. Um, so we can do this with uh, an if, elif, and else statement. Uh, as you can see on here, uh, we're using the conditions in the if, the top if statement, uh, do all the sides equal each other? 
then we know it's an equilateral, so it will output equilateral triangle. Uh, then we're checking to see if two of the sides are equal. So is side one and side two equal, or is side one and side three equal, or is side two and side three equal? So you've only got three pairs that could be equal to each other. So you can check all of those. Um, if, if that comes out true, so if one of these is equal, then uh, it will output isosceles triangle. And if it fails that statement, it will move to the else and print scaling triangle because there's no other options left. Uh, so we can play around with this. I'm going to move to the Adobe sandbox and I'm going to copy the code because that will take me a while so, to type out. So may I jump in at this point? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the fascinating things about Python is the fact that you can have multiple equals, yeah, or a, a qua yeah, equality statements as a compound statement. So in a lot of traditional programming languages, you've got to have and and an and and an and. But here with the compound equal, it actually works out to be quite yeah, simpler coding. Mm -hmm. or more logical student understandable coding the students do struggle with boolean comparators like and or and not but there in that equal 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 side two equal equal side three statement it almost describes the thing as it is neat little bit of pro coding there uh so one of the the main design um elements of Python was for it to be human readable. So that's where it, it comes in. It's to be as human readable as possible. Um, OK, so we have our comment at the top. Um, we're taking side one as an input, converting it to a float again, uh, again for side two and side three. And then we enter our if statement. If we run this code, um, we can enter uh 3.5 uh let's test equilateral triangle so let's do all 3.5 oh that was my mistake <laughs> uh let me clear that and run it again 3.5 3.5 3.5 3 so we get equilateral triangle because all the sides are equal and it matches the first if statement we run it again and I accidentally showed this already. So let's go for isosceles. So two of them will be equal. Let's go five, two, and five. Uh, so this is actually matching this statement here. So side one and side three are equal. Uh, so it outputs isosceles triangle. We run it one more time. And we'll make them all different. So one, three, five. Well, six. <laughs> um, so now it's failing the if statement, failing the elif statement, and moving to the else statement and outputting scaling triangle. Um, any questions? After 20 years, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to take that as a prompt to explain case and switch, Andrew? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, one of the sort of interesting things, again, that um, Jason Eiler, mo most programming languages historically have always had um, like a select case statement or switch case statement, where rather than having lots of nested ifs or compound ifs, you can have a simple, yeah, if, if condition equals A or condition equals one or condition equals 1.5 or something like that, then you do something and you can actually have that nice sort of match case scenario. So if I just briefly disrupt and share my screen, because um, as soon as our good friend said that, so you can actually now have um, a simple sort of match case scenario where so I'm just going to zoom in to the screen where you know you can say a simple sort of command or simple input um, is then testing multiple um, sort of conditions. So the match cases are sort of somewhat tidier. It's just intriguing that it's it's taken this long to appear in Python, probably because there's been pressure, and probably because purists are more fans of the if 
Elsif approach. If Elsif is more powerful, because you can test a range and variance of conditions, where a match case is more used if you're to do sort of a, a standard set of conditions, like a menu, set of menu options, or yeah, you you know, you sort of you've got an age range, or yeah, it's a one to ten scenario, or an A to Z scenario. But yeah, what we are learning with Python is it's a rapidly moving, rapidly evolving language, whereas um, so certain other languages are a little bit more static when it comes to their core conditions and their core statement. Back over to you, sir. Uh, uh, something that I would point out is that um, because that is the latest version, it's not implemented on um, the sandbox. So this is only working at 3.7. Um, yeah, it's working at th Python 3.7, so that wouldn't actually work on this sandbox. But if you were to download it and install the interpreter locally, then you could have the latest version. Uh, okay. Okay, so we'll move on to strings and other data types. So the main data types that are covered in the course are as follows. So you have integer and float. Integer is whole numbers. Yes. Uh, integer is whole numbers. Um, and float allows you to add decimal points. The reason we were using float earlier is if you're um, measuring, you'd probably measure to a decimal point rather than a whole integer, depending on what measurements you're using. Um, so there are your general like numbers that you're going to be using in Python. We mentioned strings before. They're always in quotation marks in Python. Um, and they are a string of characters. We've kind of mentioned booleans. So booleans are always true or false. Um, they can also be represented by one and zero. Uh, so one being true, false being zero. Um, other data types that get kind of more complex as we go along. Yes. Um, so for a list, uh, we will use square brackets and then comma separated values. Uh, doesn't have to be integers. It can be um, any other type of data as well. Um, with a list, you can edit what is in that list using positional um, positional uh, functions. So if we wanted to change this one to a seven, you would say that placeholder zero needs to be equal to uh, seven. Uh, we always count from zero, so zero, one, two, three, four. Um, the next data type would be a tuple. Um, so this uses regular brackets. Uh, tuples are kind of like read-only data, almost. Um, once you set them, you can't edit the values within them easily. <laughs> um, the advantage of tuples are that they take up uh, less physical memory on the computer. So if you have a reason that you would only use it once or you don't want it to be changed, then um, you would probably use a tuple over a list. Andrew, can you mute yourself? Thanks. Um, no problem. Uh, so uh, the next one would be dictionaries. Uh, so they use curly braces. They come in pairs. So you have a key and an answer separated by a colon. And you can have multiple pairs in a dictionary. So we have here key one, an answer, key two, an answer two. Um, another data type that I wanted to point out was the none type. Um, so you might be more familiar with like null um, if you haven't used Python before. 
um, it's basically a non value. Um, so if you equal it to none, then it has no value. You can't use it for multiplication or addition or anything like that. OK. So. OK, that's. There's a missing bracket off of that. Let's move to this example. I'm going to copy it into the sandbox. OK, so. Uh, a program to display formatted messages with line break. So you can format strings using the line break. Um, uh, so the slash is like a breakout from the code and N means a new line. I've just switched them around. Um, so this program takes a variable, takes an input and assigns it to it. So it asks for a name. Uh, and then the same again with age. So age is a variable, takes an integer input of enter your age. Uh, and then there's two different methods of outputting on two separate lines. So you can use f strings. Um, they allow you to um, format the, format the output into the console a lot better. Um, I don't think f strings are really covered in the PCEP and PCAP um, course. It's more uh, your classic um, print statements. So. The f string is assigned to the message, and then we print the message on multiple lines. Then we're going to have a space, so you can have a blank uh, print statement. It just ha leaves a blank line. Uh, and then again, we're going to print the message, but in a different format. So we have your name is, and then it's going to print the name. And on the second line, it will say your age is and print the age. So if we run this, so Jason, your age is 28. And you can see how it formats the um, the F string first. So hello, Jason, uh, you get the new line and you are 28 years old. If we take that new line out and run it again, Jason, you can see that it all comes on one line. If we wanted the second example to, to be on one line, we could have it all in one print statement. Um, we could also have this in one print statement and use a, a new line character. So you've got multiple ways of formatting strings output into the console. And they are covered in uh, PSEP as well, the first half of the Python course. Uh, OK. Let's look at the other types of data. Give me a second to get the code. OK, so. Uh, so if we take a look at each uh, individual type of um, Yes. Uh, OK, so we can use this to see that the integer and the class is int. Uh, you can I'm just going to run through the the different data types. So with a float, you can see that it allows for decimals 3.14. If we run this, we get float 3.14 class float. So we're using the type of uh, the type function. If we do a string, we've been playing with strings already, you can see string, hello Python, and the class is str, the string. We can also do Boolean. So if we look at the Boolean values, we can have is true or is false. And if we run that, you see we get Boolean true, Boolean false, and the class is bool. Interesting. Function always added to count to the end of the 
yes, that is true as well. I think that's covered in the PSAP um, materials as well. Uh, so we can look at a list as well. Um, so using the square brackets, comma separated values, if we run that, you can see uh, we get a list output and the class is a list. Likewise with the tuple, if we run that one. Uh, so uses regular brackets and the class is tuple. Uh, just by changing the the brackets that this is in, enclosed in is what sets the data type. Uh, so this one is a dictionary. We've got name, John, age, 30. Uh, if we print the dictionary, then you get the whole um, the whole dictionary printed out with a class of uh, dict. Uh, okay, and the last one I mentioned was none. So if we uh, assign the keyword none to the variable my none and run that, you get a none type uh, output. So now we've covered all the data types. Let's go to. Did I do that one? I did that one, this one. OK. Uh, just to reiterate the, the difference between um, integers and floats, we have a program that uses both and does a calculation on them of uh, divide by three. Uh, so if I run this, you'll see that the integer, uh, when it's divided, gets converted to a float, and you end up with um, 3.333 as a, a decimal output. Uh, if you divide the float, then you also get a float output. Uh, remember, the key the key difference is the decimal values between integer and float. Okay. So with a list, you can um, iterate through it. So as an example, I'm just going to show you this. Uh, hold on. This code. Let's replace those. So um, a program to calculate the sum of all the even numbers. So if we have a list of numbers, you can see our list is defined here in the square brackets. Uh, then we can declare a variable of sum of the, the evens and equal it to zero immediately. So it starts from zero. And then we can do a for loop, which um, which Andrew mentioned earlier. So we can do for number, so each individual number in numbers, the variable. Uh, then we can then do an, a nested if statement of if the number modulo 2 equals equals 0, so I probably need to explain modulo, uh, modulo will uh, do the division and then look at the remainder. So if the number is odd and then you try and divide by 2, you can have a remainder of 1. Um, so that would then state that that is odd. Uh, if you do modulo divide by two uh, and the number is even, then you're going to have a modulo of zero. So that means the number is even. So it's a quick way to uh, evaluate whether a number is even or odd. Um, if if it is an even number, then we're going to add that number to sum of evens. Uh, then it will repeat that in, in the for loop for the entire list. Once it's done that, it will then move to the print statement underneath. The sum of the even numbers uh, is then the output of this variable. So if I just run this, you can see it adds the even numbers up to 30. Um, 
what I was saying about lists versus tuples, you can uh, you can look at this code. So program to show the difference between lists and tuples. So we're using the import syst. So we're starting to look at libraries and how to import them into Python. Um, that is covered in the, the second half of the Python content in the PCAP uh, certification. Um, so if we define a list uh, of one, two, three, four, five as, as a list, and then we check the size of that list, how, how many bytes it is using, uh, and we do the same thing, but as a tuple, if we run this, you'll see that the number of bytes used by a list is a little bit more than the tuple size, but imagine these are significantly longer lists or tuples, that data um, size difference gets bigger and bigger. Uh, if we wanted to change this, so I said that we could edit a list. So if we go uh, my list, uh, then we use a placeholder, so square brackets, and then we want to change three to say seven. So we start at uh, zero, zero, one, two. So this would be two. And we can equal that to seven. Uh, then we're going to have to print the list because it's not being shown at the moment. Uh, print my list. Uh, if we run this, then you can see that the third number in that list has been changed. If we do the same with the tuple, we will get an error message. Uh, so if I do my tuple and then square bracket, square brackets, two, yes, back, back to counting from zero, uh, equals seven, oh, equals seven. Then we run it. You get an error message. Tuple does not support item assignment, so you, it's you can't edit a tuple like you would a list. Can you think of any uh, possible reasons to use that? Anyone in the chat? The, I was going to say months of the year or days of the week would make a nice tuple, wouldn't it? Yeah. Sorry to, I'm not person in the group, but <laughs> that <laughs> fell it. out of my head. Yeah. <laughs> get on now. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned none. Um, we can have a look at the none value. So if we move to that, let's have a look at this. Well, I'm going to have to do some editing. Okay. Let's clear the console. OK, so this is a little bit more advanced. Um, you're defining a function. Uh, again, this is covered in the second half on PCAP. So we're defining check names as a, or check name as a um, as a function. And then you can start assigning like um, arguments to that that function. Um, in this case, we have name as an argument. And by default, we're going to assign it to the value of none. Uh, then our function says, if the name is none, then print no name specified. So by default, you're kind of catching that um, argumentless statement. Uh, else, print hello and the name that's provided. And then we're using that function in our code to check name John and check name blank. So what would the expected output be of of this code? If you can type it in the chat. I don't know how quick, how much of a delay there is. Uh, oh, no, no, exactly. So if we run it, we get hello John, and then no name specified because we're running that function twice. So it 
this is calling the check names function and then it does this with john as the the uh the name and then it calls this function again and this time it it matches the if statement so it prints no specific uh, no name specified uh okay so we're at a point where we were going to move on to applications of python coding um a few of the applications that i've come across um i think andrew's got a few more that he'll probably talk about um i've come across it in web development so you've got frameworks um such as django and flask um so that in kind of including front end and server side scripting um you've got data science and machine learning so you might want to start uh using libraries such as numpy pandas uh metaplot map matplotlib um tensorflow for like machine learning uh i've seen it in scientific computing you you've probably seen it in jupyter notebook because i think you've been using that as uh as a tool within this course uh I mostly use it for automation and scripting. Uh, so you can automate repetitive tasks. Um, Cisco themselves are moving to a world where you're going into software defined networking and um, you're using playbooks within uh, like Chef or something like that to automate network changes uh, depending on certain conditions. Um, System administration, network programming, testing. So if you're testing and you have to repeat a test uh, a thousand times, um, it would be quite useful to be able to script that. So you could use Python to do that. Um, some desktop application development, uh, PyQt uh, is one that I've used. I haven't used the other one. Um, game dev, so you've got Pygame. You could do some prototyping in Python might not be the best coding language to do games in but certainly available do you have anything to add andrew you're on mute so i just realized as soon as i started speaking that i was on mute um that that is a classic one i'm afraid yeah i mean it's quite interesting um it's interesting you talk about automation scripting because it's actually quite heavily used um, in the world of cyber security and forensics as well, for good and bad reasons. Um, because obviously you can run all manner of um, web automation scripts to do things. And there is a very useful API library called Selenium, where you can actually automate the control of web pages. And myself and others have used that, where it will auto form fill auto navigate and auto page scrape as well which means that you could literally build a robot that goes for a website to do things or to, yeah interact with um different environments on the internet so obviously that way it then behaves yeah as if it's you so even if it's got um I, yeah, you know the basic I am not a robot um, click. Well, it can do that. I mean, it does, it, even though the software is supposed to test how long it takes you to click on that, they're now randomizing pauses and things. So um, Python is, yeah, becoming a tool for the sort of the dark side of the internet. Um, it's also quite popular because of the foundation of the Raspberry Pi and Raspberry Pi has full Python integration. Uh, whilst it's been used a lot in computer science for schools using Raspberry Pis, there's actually a lot of Raspberry Pis out there doing real world jobs, running smart systems, IoT systems, televisions, vending machines. I so use one in my car. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> I know we were going to talk about your diving um, in a moment. We're going to so what do you do in your car, Jason? Uh, so I have a Raspberry Pi in my car. It's a, it's a, so my car's really old, 21-year-old Land Rover Discovery. Um, and I wanted Android Auto in my car. So I <laughs> put a Raspberry Pi in with a laptop screen. Um, and I've started coding in like OBD ports so I can check the temperature of the engine and all kinds of stuff like that. 
um it was just a little project that i was doing yeah no that's cool i mean what what applications are you looking at what kind of diving do you do uh so i do uh, very technical diving um very uh deep diving that requires decompression procedures and calculations um so there are um there are algorithms to calculate how much decompression you need to do to come up from depths of 100 130 meters for example um and it gives you all the stops you need to do and uh we've managed to reproduce that algorithm into python scripts where you enter the depth the amount of time you're going to spend and then it outputs um how many stops you need to do at what kind of depth for how long so yeah it's, it's a great tool that's a great tool for not dying yeah exactly <laughs> it keeps me alive <laughs> yeah quite quite a value to put quite a valid use of, and there is no limits i mean it's used in space science nasa used it they use it on um yeah some of the systems that work with their yeah planet-based robotic systems i know my science colleagues at the open university teach python as part of our science degree um it doesn't matter which science because now obviously it's large-scale data like Terry pointed out, checking temperature in the beehive. Well, if you capture the data over a long period of time, there is probably some good data science about yeah the um the bee environment that could be extracted and learned from as well as part of research or create, creating the right kind of environmental systems. So it's yeah the beauty of Python is there's a lot of community-based APIs and it's easy to code and easy to develop. I mean, if you move to the next slide, slide please, Jason. I mean, what what other, other applications, um, what other applications could you sort of um, think of as a group that you've come across? Don't be shy. What's Anaconda? Astro Pi. I've come across the Astro Pi, yeah. Okay, so weather station B, totally two different environments, but similar principle. It's about sensor data. I mean, with the automation, you need an API, and it de depends on what you want to automate as well. So that question, which library is used for automation, it depends what you're automating. So if you're automating a cloud Cisco environment, or you're changing the IP address or the sub interfaces on an interface, you'll need the Cisco Python API and yeah, like a CSR 1000 router. Um, to do it with, but that's a specific example where you'd have an automation library um, for a specific control device, whether it's yeah your um, uh, yeah your robot vacuum cleaner or whatever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take control for a second and give a sneak peek of our next session because I'm mindful that we've got a little bit of time to play with here, Jason. That's okay. So I'm going to just share my screen. Um, I'm aware that some of you are network engineers. Uh, yeah, and have come from the sort of traditional Netacad program. Um, one of the beauties now in Netacad with Packet Tracer, which is also free, is as we've intimated, it's got Python built into it, um, but it's got Python built into it so that you can actually use coding as part of the automation within the simulated environment. Um, Packet Tracer actually uses something called a REST API, which means that you can actually get Packet Tracer to via an MQTT environment to talk to external devices. So you can actually get it to talk to real world equipment. You can get it to automate. So a colleague of mine did an experiment with some interns a um, couple of years ago before the pandemic of um, getting Packet Tracer 
to control one of those little now robots. They've got the robot to walk around TV based on network environmental settings. And it's quite easy to access. So if I just go into devices and literally throw in a PC into Packet Tracer and go into the programming tab, I mean, it really is as easy as um, pick your language. Obviously, JavaScript there because that is another API environment. If I actually bring up Python and just create it and just go straight into main.py. And I just, just want to interrupt for a sec. What's that? Uh, Terry said that he can't see the screen, but I can. Okay. Can we, is anybody yeah. else? I, I can it? too. I can too. Yeah. Okay. okay. Terry, it's just it's just been in Northamptonshire. I'm sure the cat cables <laughs> cables now too soggy. <laughs> Sorry, Terry and I have known each other a long time. He deserves a little bit of banter. Okay, but I've just yeah, it's nothing clever to prove here. We're actually now in this environment. And immediately, we've also got a coding environment that we can actually run and code with. What we've got now is quite a few of our Cisco academies using this code environment to develop simulated real world automation projects. A lot of schools out there cannot afford a lot of equipment and they're still limited by the amount of Raspberry Pis they can have. Here now with the Python environment, you can actually build IoT automation or network automation and even network security based projects where it will actually talk to a range of devices. What you might also find useful is obviously this session today is about Python. I'm just going to briefly show this to you for wow factor. Most of you know this. Most of you know the Scratch or Blockly environment. If you've got introductory or formative students, you can code in this as well. And it's got a lot of the functionality, but it's got the networking functionality. You can actually build a HTTP server or HTTP client. You can actually generate HTTP or other yeah, IP based or TCP or UDP um, based traffic using Packet Tracer as well. And if you actually have got Packet Tracer downloaded and you go into the open samples, obviously it's going to say, do you want to do that? Um, there is a lot of pre-built programming examples that you can actually go in and review. And there is a nice set of infrastructure automation and IoT examples that you can look at as well from a coding perspective. And why I just show that to you is I'm not going to go through and dive in and look at each and every one of them. But there is a lot of examples. So somebody asked about automation. Well, you can go in here and look at an example piece of code and actually look at the um, device. So I'll just click on advanced for this one, get the programming tab up. And you can see pre built Python code that you can get your students to adapt, build on, or learn from. So then you can then build, yeah, build sort of a range of elements and it will run multiple sets of different code and you'll start recognizing some of the coding functionality that comes from the PSEP or PCAP. I'm going to explore that a little bit more at the end of this month, but I just thought let's just show it to you at the moment because the challenge often in teaching coding, and it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, it's actually just finding that realistic enough environment for your students to get something out of when they're at school. Here on Packet Tracer, no, it's not real. However, it is close enough to real that it's actually using real world protocols in simulation and real world coding in this simulated virtualized environment. So you can generate and create all manner of network automation and network security behaviors in this environment without upsetting the network manager and without you losing your job because you've just taught your students how to hack into the email server, which is a very naughty thing. And I would never have ever done that when I was um, teaching in an FE college. So back back to you in the slides, please, Jason.
So I think we've done that slide. Yeah, we're doing that. So I think it's now time for a sort of 10 minutes um, discussion. And, you know, we're just a little bit ahead of schedule by about seven minutes, which isn't a bad thing considering how it takes, yeah, it's a time when you've got three people working on this remotely. So what's from your perspective as experienced or developing computer science professionals, how could you use some of the things that we've shown you today to enable and improve the teaching that you're doing in your schools, colleges, universities, or training providers? Everybody go shy for a little while, don't they? Uh, yeah. So Russell, whereabouts are you based again? Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of work going on in that account in Canada and I'm doing, yeah, doing in that, having that same thing that we're doing in the UK. And what I have personally found is if I show a group of school teachers one or two things in Python or in the Edube environment or in Netacad, and they see that it's easier and saves them work. It tends to work well, but I tend to try, I tend to get them to try it out and try it out. And I also get them to experiment with their students and treat a group of students as their pilot testers for the first run. And it tends to be very successful. So we've got schools around the UK that are using this at different levels in different forms, but very much in a, you know, a com complementing our national GCSE qualifications. Yeah, and I think you're right, uh, Ms. Cater. Um, having a differentiated scheme of work, you could easily have some students who are weaker do yeah just some of the more functional coding procedural PSAP and some that manage to advance at their own pace onto the PCAP and that is the nice thing also about the Netica curriculum is a student can do as much or maybe painfully as little as they need to do um, there is still measure measure of success and now that, that Cisco are releasing digital badges and certificates of completion, there is at least some reward process for students getting to certain waypoints um, in the curriculum as well. And the digital badges help in their long term professional profiles. I was part of a um, discussion this morning um, with some unrelated individuals. And it is actually quite amazing how popular digital badges have become as a measure of success. And magically, talking of school teachers that I know that teach Python, Violetta has um, just appeared in this session. Hello, Violetta. It's been a very long time. Yeah, and yeah, I agree. Certs and badges. Well, I'm going to open that one up to you, Lewis, and how you um, how you are spreading your word, um, yeah, within Portugal and how you're working with us and Collectic. So I'm going to mute for a moment and let um, Lewis. Well, uh, let me explain exactly what this what this sequence of webinars is in terms of what we are trying to do when we are talking about uh, computing program in uh, 12 year 12 years of mandatory education okay so in this in the first three uh, uh, in the first three webinars we have been talking how we are trying to apply all those um, ideas and concepts related with uh, functional programming uh, the 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 link to the to what they, the students are learning when they are learning the, the mother language, 
the, the link with mathematics and so on. OK, so the idea is that we do all that and we intend to do all that in the first six years. OK, so it's what we call in Portugal the first and second cycle. OK, then when we are going to the third cycle, we are already talking about going deep and start doing programming using a programming environment okay and on that uh, uh, that idea in our uh, from our point of view is that to try to use and try to start using uh, a programming language that is more mainstream okay and that can go into uh, the some uh, uh, well more popular uh, uh, ideas related with programming, okay, like uh, creating uh, web applications or, or small programs that will run in a, a, a calculator or anything uh, or something like that, okay. So when we are talking now about, about Python, we are doing and dealing with those kind of environments. And so our idea is precisely to prepare the students in the first six years or more, OK, because we are still trying to figure out if we should start, for instance, with a language like Python in the grade eight or grade nine. OK, but we are still doing some experiments on that. But for sure is that when we are talking about the third cycle, so we are talking about the, the last three years before what we call the secondary level or the pre-universitary level, we are already talking about using a, an environment and a programming language like Python, for instance. Apologies, I was just answering Miss Cater's question at the same time because can you're asking, can you put your own badges in? I don't know, but I can't see why not because the um, Moodle integration, as long as they um, do something that passes the step that generates a badge, why not? And I'm, yeah, I am known in the Cisco Academy community as a little bit of an anarchist. And yeah, these kind of anarchistic things will generate some great conversations um, with our friends at Cisco. And I'm actually meeting some people at the conference next week, including Giuseppe Cinque, who is the principal architect of the platform. And it might be the conversation, yeah, it might be the awkward question I'd like to ask him. I mean, we're also, um, working with computing at school in the UK. A um, little bit of a positive history. There was a lot of work before the pandemic. Pandemic slowed matters down for everybody in different ways, and it went dormant. Now it's re-engaging. The protagonist behind that, Duncan Maidens, now works for Raspberry Pi, and um, Cisco have approached us at the Open University, and we just happen to have a computing at school master teacher, Phil Hackett, who also works on my team as well, where um, we're hoping to get him engaged to sort of build, build that up and build up the community and build up the work. So it's, uh, yeah, so in the answer to all the questions, the answer is yes, let's talk. Yes, reach out to me. Yes, my email is easy. It's andrew.smith at open.ac.uk. You can see it in the slides. And we want to find ways. I don't care if you're in Luton, Nova Scotia, or South Carolina, or anywhere else. My belief is let's work together to um, develop um, global coding education because it will benefit my students in the UK as much as Lewis's students in Portugal, Martina's students in Spain and anybody's students anywhere else. And actually it's been a, um, yeah, it, it's been a great journey so far. And some of it because of COVID has actually taught us to think differently and actually, yeah, explore what is important and what we need to do. And I would be fair and say we've all made a few mistakes as well. Um, 
uh, over this last three years. So everybody's rethinking, re-engaging, and we're seeing a lot more growth and opportunity. Um, my view is if you become a, if you're not a Cisco Academy, become one just to access this content and experiment with it. If you're already a Cisco Academy or a Cisco instructor, why not create a Python course tonight or this afternoon or tomorrow and immediately dive in and get a group of students on it to become your um, yeah, action research oriented experimenters, teaching you a little bit about how you're going to benefit from the coding as well. My view is professional certification is not the be or end all, but I do think it, it's a good development route and digital badges takes this yeah away. And I noticed a few of you are sort of um, sort of noting that it will work probably it will work from about age 13 onwards and you could probably use edu quite comfortably from sort of age nine onwards with students as well and packet tracer um, as long as you've got it installed locally will work quite comfortably so can you move to the next slide please jason so if you qr code that and obviously it's going to be on the recording as well. We have actually created a micro resource on how to um, create a Python course on Netcad. I'm actually just going to go to the link myself and share it in the chat just to make um, life easier for everybody. This resource is going to be permanent and we're probably just going to update it and tweak it as time goes on just to improve it as um, change are made. But part of the Erasmus Plus um, funding was to enable you to have access to resources like this. So just bear with me as I now remember where I put the link. Hey, there it is. My apologies. So I'm just going to go to the direct external link. Bear with me. I've just got an internet loading moment going on on my screen. So if you're actually part of the um, Python course, then you should be able to access this. And we've created this resource for everybody to um, see, which is the public Python course management. We've designed it so that you can get at it from any device and it will simply step you through the creation of a Python course on this platform. Because I showed you very quickly, you're going to go away and for legal reasons, probably forget some of what I've shown you. Um, this is designed to take you no more than 50 minutes to read and to um, actually sort of re repeat and develop and then go back to when you've just um, forgotten something else and it also talks about how you can generate certificates in there and also that bit where I showed you how to adapt the course um, to actually suit your own purposes and your own center as well so on that bombshell um, it's now the end of the session, the end of the day, and um, the end of this our time together as a webinar. Thank you all very much for being very patient with us. Um, Jason, would you like to sort of do any sort of su summarization? Uh, so yeah, just so um, everything that I showed within this presentation has been covered in PSAP or PCAP. Um, so they're the topics that your students will be learning. So it's a great overview of, of what's to come. Yeah, and and Lewis? Yeah, so as I said, uh, Andrew, the most important thing now is that uh, you you can go then to, to the, the platform, the Cisco platform, and then in the next few days, you'll see there the link for these recording video okay and uh, you can also uh, participate in our forum okay because it's uh, available there uh, as well and so let's keep in touch and try to discuss everything yeah. that we have we have been discussing in these four webinars
And what I will also do is put up the PowerPoint slide shortly because Jason has got copies of all the code snippets in there. Forgive me, so you can copy and paste and utilize and experiment with. So thank you all very much. I'm going to go for a nice cup of tea now. OK, take yeah, care, and everybody. Thank you. And thank you, thank Andrew. You. Thank you, Jason. And Bye. thank you, everybody. Okay. Take care, everybody. And bon dia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's my limit of Portuguese, so yeah, bon dia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.